God, thank you so much for people that are here. The opportunity to talk, God, I, I feel for. God, I just, uh, God, I feel for everybody who has to deal with abuse and has to deal with some of these bad teachings. And uh, as I dig into this, God, I just hope that we'll shed light on your word and your heart. That God, as we, uh, as we dig into it, that you will kind of change some of our perceptions, but help us to mold ourselves to, to your view of things and in a way that is loving and enlightening and blessing to, uh, to those who are struggling in some of these situations. So uh, open your word, and I pray your Holy Spirit to speak today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk today. That's your topic, but we're going to talk about divorce. So because we talk about abuse within the church situation, I feel like we have to go into this. So a lot of people are like, oh, I'll get into some ugly stuff. But I love it uh, because I, I feel like there's a lot of grace and mercy in here that doesn't often get taught. So, um, so just think about it. Um, so what do you do if you're a young 20-something woman, you left, married less than three years, and you find out your husband has a long-standing secret habit of looking at child pornography? That's the dilemma the young lady Karen Hinckley found herself in. So she was on the mission field. She was a missionary in Eastern Asia with her husband. And she knew something was off. She knew that he was hiding something and she couldn't figure out what. But, you know, newlywed, she kept asking questions and he was cagey with her. He initially finally admitted to some pornography usage, but she kind of knew her instincts. Like, there's that doesn't seem to be it. Like, there was more. So she kind of kept pestering him. She kept asking questions, detailed questions. And finally, one day, the whole truth kind of came out. And uh, her husband, Jordan, admitted he'd been looking at child pornography for like 10 years. Um, and it, it was, I mean, really bad uh, stuff. So to her credit, so Karen reported it to the missions organization that had sent them to their sending church. So their church is the Village Church. I don't know if any of you are Matt Chandler's fans, but um, <laughs> it was him that did it. So Matt Taylor was not the person she specifically reported, but his church. So that was their sending church. So she reports it to the village church. So um, Jordan, the, the guy, came clean with the missions organization as well. He totally admitted everything. So they were sent home, obviously. There, no evidence, they had no admission of actually harming any children, like that he actually did anything with a child. And they found no evidence of that so far. But... Um, Karen was adamant like, that she really wanted parents to know in case there were any hidden victims. She was adamant, like, we need to make this public. We need to let all the families of the church know and all this kind of stuff. And the church was kind of resistant to any kind of public uh, naming of the specifics of his sin. They just kind of generally said that because of his personal sin, he was you know, kind of being sent home. They didn't want to go into it. So Karen resigned her membership at the church. She started going to counseling, and she made a move to annul her marriage. They'd been married less than three years. And so at, at this point is where things got kind of really weird with the church. So Karen and Jordan had signed what's called a, a covenant membership agreement with the church. I will say as an aside, we're not talking about those kind of things today. But um, if the church ever pushes for covenant membership things, I would, I would stay away. I've heard a lot of bad things. <laughs> that it turns into like kind of a very hard line like you, you sign this covenant to become a member and you've agreed to all kinds of things it becomes very hard to get out of um, but anyway in it in this agreement they had agreed to walk through the steps of marriage reconciliation at the village church before pursuing divorce from my spouse that's one of the things she agreed to so first of all you know the covenant agreement I think is already an issue but Karen, Karen had told them she wanted to resign her membership she didn't want to go there she was already frustrated with kind of their reluctance before um, so the church leaders got very kind of bothered by her response. They, they put her under church discipline. If you remember when we talked about Matthew 18 and stuff from church, uh, the last time, um, this talk about like they were, you know, treat her as a Gentile or tax collector, it talks about, right? So to say, Karen, um, so the church is concerned that this lady had not, she'd so quickly moved to end her marriage without attempting to reconcile under their counsel. That, that was kind of their push with her. 
Um, so we, we ended up in a very absurd situation in the church, right? So you had Jordan, this, this husband who had admitted to his struggle, he was seen as repentant because he was honest about it and because he was doing whatever they said at that moment. Um, he was cooperative. So the church urged members to show him grace and mercy, and they, they did eventually start admitting all this under some pressure. Um, so they urged a lot of grace and kindness to him. Karen, however, was put under church discipline, and the church was moving to excommunicate her. So uh, there's also an understood, at least implicit understanding. When you get into this church discipline type of language, a lot of people, even if the church doesn't say this, for a lot of people, their churches have said in the past, they start hearing it's Matthew 18, Trina is a Gentile, tax. a lot of people hear shunning. That's what, how a lot of people will take it. I guess I'm not supposed to talk to them. I'm supposed to like avoid them. Even if the church doesn't push that, that's often the culture of it. So you enter that territory. So you have, you end up this very backwards thing where a man with a 10 year child pornography habit and who, who knows, we don't know if he acted on that with children in any other way outside of that, but he was accepted and welcomed. And then this wife who discovered it blew the whistle was seen as the bad guy because she wanted to end her marriage to this guy. So as bizarre as it is, I mean, Village Church isn't actually the worst example of this kind of thing, but um, because they had to be pushed uh, to revealing it publicly, but they did. When they did, they were pretty open and they actually did take some, some good things to kind of protect their uh, flock from that, from this guy. Um, that he was, to make sure he wasn't around any children, to make sure, you know, that they did do some good things under, under pressure once they were finally forced to. Um, and they eventually did apologize to Karen about the whole church discipline thing. They eventually backed off a lot of that. Um, but the bottom of all of this really is, is not really about the village church, but it's, this is kind of what happens when we, I, I feel like we have a, a view of marriage and divorce sometimes that borders on idolatry, really. We become so obsessed with not allowing any divorce that we lose track of like how we're treating people. Like th that, and this is one of these weird examples that for a long there was just this hyper focus on we, we can't let a divorce happen so much that we just lose all common sense of like, wait, this woman's the victim here. Like she just found out her husband's looking at child pornography. She should not be the one under church discipline, <laughs> if at all, right? Like, so uh, the, the heavy burdens are put on people in destructive marriages to prevent divorce so that you end up having, especially when we're talking about an abuse scenario, you end up having people that are pressured to return to their abusers and continue to suffer. That's the, the concern, right? When we get into an abuse context. So when the fruit of your position is to punish a betrayed wife while you're accepting the long-term child pornography user, like something got very wrong, right? Like, like the, the result of this, the fruit of this situation shows like something was way off. Um, so many times for an abused person, right? When we talk about abuse, getting out is the only option for getting safe. And so, without that option many abused women would be continuing to get hurt so when we talk about abuse if we're talking about someone who's harm i'm harming you to make me feel better that's what i'm going to we're, we're talking about abuse a simple way of thinking about it is a harmful relationship so if you're in a harm you're in a relationship where there is power different a big power differential in the relationship where there is manipulation going on where violating consent is happening where you are dehumanized and treated like an object um, you likely have to evaluate your options to get out and to get safe. And so that's where the Bible teaching on divorce sometimes becomes a hindrance for Christians, right? To say, to say but I can't because the Bible won't let me, right? And that's what, I, that's what I want to talk about today. I want to dispel some of that, <laughs> especially some of the bad ways that certain things are taught to, because we see a lot of divorce in our culture and there's this reaction backlash of, we don't want to encourage divorce ever, so we want to, you know, resist that. So then we teach, but we teach some of these in a wrong way that the Bible doesn't even teach. And so I want to address some of that today and just kind of change our perception of it because if someone needs to get safe, I want them to feel free to get safe and not be held up because they think they're not allowed to leave a, an abusive person. So um, how should we revisit this? So I, I want to start with Jesus' words because... I mean, what, why do we have such a strong reaction, right? Well, what, this debate starts with Jesus. So we've got a big part of this is his strong words. So there's this debate. So we look at 19, 3, Matthew 19, verse 3. 
So some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? So, as you may not know, Jesus, Jesus is entering a long-standing debate. So when they come up and ask him this question, there is a, they, they go back to Deuteronomy and the original statement in Deuteronomy about a man can give his wife a certificate of divorce, uh, and it references a man if he finds indecency in his wife. So at that time, between different camps uh, amongst the Jews, there was this big, um, big debate about what that indecency had to be. Right. So you have some people, you have a, one faction that said anything that he doesn't like about her. Right. If if she burns his dinner and he doesn't like it, he can. If he doesn't like it, he has the right, and he just gives her a certificate of divorce. You have this one side that's like freely anything you want. Uh, there's, and then there was another faction that said that indecency could only be for some kind of sexual unfaithfulness, right? And so these two camps go at it. This is, so this is kind of like ongoing debate. So when they're coming to Jesus, they're saying, which side are you on, Jesus? <laughs> Here's the debate. Which side are you on? So that's, that's what they're setting up. They want to know where Jesus stands. So here's 19.4-6. through He answered and he said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So Jesus takes a strong stand. So what Jesus doesn't really take either side. He's like, it was never meant to be. Divorce was never meant to be. So he's kind of not letting either one of them win, in a sense, as he likes to do. But he's taking a very strong stance on the importance of commitment. That's his initial strong stance. Is He wants them to go back to the very beginning of creation and see how God has done something powerful when two people get married. He made two separate people into a unit of one, and they're now one family. The intention is for them to be unified and to fulfill his mission. He wants them to rule over the earth well and to be made, to be fruitful, to multiply. That's this, these terminology. And... If you go back to the beginning, God had decided that not man would not do that very well by himself. And so he creates a woman to be his ally, right? And so Jesus, going back to that, is saying, you know, this was intended to be permanent. The whole idea of marriage was not for divorce. That was never the idea, right? And so we hear these strong words from Jesus. It's like, okay, it's never a good thing that a separation has to occur. But that... That didn't satisfy them because they're like, okay, but, right? So 19, 7, 8, they said to him, well, then why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He says to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it has not been this way, right? So they're referencing, that's Deuteronomy 24 that they're quoting, the one in the capital letters there. They're saying, well, Moses said, right? First of all, Moses didn't say, he didn't command, so that's a little bit already a little off. He didn't say, go give her a certificate of divorce. He just said, if you said, he's kind of a, an if scenario, at least give her a certificate of divorce. It's kind of the way it is in Deuteronomy. It's never commanded. But I want you to look at Jesus' answer. This, it's because of your hardness of heart that he gave you this in the first place, that he permitted it through Moses. And so it was never the design. And so I want to, to just, I, I won't, dig into Deuteronomy and Leviticus or go back into any of that stuff, right? Because I'll bore you to tears if we try to get into the, the details of the law. But just to, to briefly tell you the design of what the original intent was, because understanding the culture, I think, is really important. What God was, what was God trying to do when he put these ideas into the law? So first, I want you to keep in mind that women really did not initiate a divorce at this time. Both the time Jesus is at but also the time of Deuteronomy. These are highly patriarchal kind of times. Women really had no way of owning land. They had no way of really taking care of themselves in the agricultural economy. So they didn't, they really had no right to initiate a divorce, but even if they did, if they were not married, they had no way of surviving. They had no way of taking care of themselves. So when he's addressing this, um, these Old Testament passages were addressing the men specifically. And um, so when a demand decided he wasn't happy with his wife for some reason and he sent her away, um, she was incredibly vulnerable. So when we go back to that original context, you have men 
without that kind of being talked about in the law, you have men who decide, I'm done with her, and they sent her away, and she's destitute. Not only that, but she had a way to take care of herself unless she remarries, but without any kind of divorce or whatever, she's either going to be seen as still being married to this other guy, so some other, an honorable man's going to be like, but you're still married to him, <laughs> right? Like, he's not going to want to take her on as his wife, even if he has compassion for her, right? And, or at the, also seen as kind of like damaged goods in that culture, right? Like, you've already been married to this guy, and, and you know, and now he's sent you away. So she quickly gets put in a position where no man wants her. She can't buy land. She can't take care of herself. She ends up destitute, right? So this, this is the situation, like going back to Deuteronomy, that Moses is addressing. There's a reason he's putting this in. He's saying if, you, if you're going to send her away, if something so egregious happens that you can't maintain your marriage and you need to send this wife away, at least give her this certificate of divorce that allows her to move on, right? That's what that piece of paper was designed to do, was to help free her up to be able to survive and be okay, right? And so that's never was never a good thing, right? Like this is why Jesus is saying, it's because of your hardness of heart. It's only because you treated your wife so poorly that I even had to put that in in the first place. If your marriages were the way they should be, I wouldn't have to even consider that. It's never great, but he's addressing these men who were not treating women well, right? And so... And this kind of patriarchal decided divorce was a way of helping a woman move forward. So here's one of our first things is the divorce, its intent originally. The original intent of divorce was to protect the vulnerable. That's what that's what he's really talking about. So keep that in mind, because I think that gets lost a little bit when we, we end up in this really hard because Jesus is drawing kind of a hard line. So it's easy to go in there and be like, oh. Jesus isn't given any wiggle room, right? Like he's being very, very harsh. But, but when you think about the situation he's, he's addressing, he's like, well, that's never, I don't, I don't ever want you going in and thinking about divorce as the direction you're going. That's, that's never a good thing. But you must, the idea of the certificate of divorce was a, a way of protecting a vulnerable person. So, but Jesus does add one more caveat. So Matthew 19, 9, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. So Jesus is being very strong with the men here, and he's saying if you leave your wife and pick up another wife, even if you give her the divorce, you're still adulterous in his eyes. Because if you feel the need to just move on because you don't like her and pick up another woman, even if you do it legally, like, oh, but I gave her the certificate, and then I married her, and you know, whatever, they would want to, like, skirt the line, do that. And he's saying, even if you're doing that, in my eyes, it's still as much as you're committing adultery because you're abandoning the wife that gave you, the one that you committed to, and then you're going after somebody else. So the only exception to the, the adultery idea was if she had been unfaithful first, right? That's the only one Jesus is giving. If you get into this, and it uses this term, when, he, when it says translate immorality, that was, it's the Greek, the Greek word is actually porneia, so it's kind of where we get pornography from. Um, but it's it's a generic word. It's a general word for sexual immorality. So it's not being specific on whether you know what type of sexual immorality we're talking about. And Jesus isn't being super specific. He's not saying you should divorce for that. He's not saying that's the only exception. He doesn't go any further with it. He's just saying, you know, I'm not talking about that. Right? He's like, except for that, there there are, there are exceptions. So we have one clear exception open to the door to divorce. The sexual unfaithfulness one is the one. The most clear, biblically obvious one, because Jesus said it himself. And I found a, a few people try to make arguments that even then we shouldn't be allowed to divorce or something, but they're pretty weak because this is quoting Jesus. So we'll, we'll get, <laughs> this one's been very specific. So certainly when there's sexual unfaithfulness, Jesus has already made exceptions. He's not saying what to do in those circumstances, but it opens the door, certainly in that case. Um, but so the other thing you will hear all the time, so if you enter into this conversation with churchy people, um, you'll hear all the time this statement, well, but God hates divorce, right? Like, has anybody heard someone say that before? <laughs> right? Okay, so I want to go, where does that come from, right? So we're, we're going to look at that directly, and um, I think some people have never read the whole context of that when they say it, but... God hates divorce. So this is coming from, well, hold on, I'll give you a little context in that first. 
what's happening here because it comes from Malachi 2. So uh, when we pull out a soundbite from Scripture, we don't understand its context. We can get ourselves in trouble here. But So this quote comes from Malachi 2. In context, Malachi was written about a hundred years after the return of Israel from captivity. So if you read, you're going through the Old Testament, they were sent away into captivity as they were captured. You get Nehemiah and Esther, uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, talking about how they returned. They rebuilt the walls and the temple and all that, right? And there's these high hopes when you get into like Nehemiah about they're going to have authentic worship back in the temple. We're going to do it right this time, right? Like God sent us away because we failed, all this bad stuff that was going on, but now we're back and we're going to do it right. And so if you remember last week, Rod made a comment about revival has only lasts for so long. <laughs> this is a perfect example. It was like revival time under Nehemiah. And then 100 years later, Malachi is coming in and saying, it's really bad again, right? So Malachi, the prophet Malachi is just going back and forth of God saying, this is all that is wrong with what you were doing. So there's this back and forth of God calling them on something, them answering like, what do you mean? We're not doing it. And then God lays out his case against them. So we get this kind of like, here's what's wrong with your worship. And so people were just as wicked as they'd been in the past. So Malachi is recording God's confrontation of the issues he's seeing in Israel. So we'll read this. So this is where it comes from. Uh, to Malachi 2, 13 and 16. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with, your, with tears, with weeping, and with groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit, and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. So, uh, first of all, remember, like our last passage we talked about, he's talking to the men, if that's not, <laughs> it's pretty clear. He's talking to the men and how they're treating their wives. Um, and at three different times, he talks about dealing, tre have dealt treacherously with them, right? Like, you're dealing treacherously with your wife, right? It's pretty harsh. So, I, I don't know, if I, if I was an abusive guy, this is not the passage you want to send <laughs> you want to send someone to if you're trying to convince your wife because if she reads the actual content she's going to be like this seems to be talking about you a lot more than me right um god is pretty harsh he does he's telling him if, if you notice at the beginning he's telling him he doesn't want to accept their sacrifices he no longer regards the offering he's saying i don't even like all the religious activity that you're doing i don't even want to hear it and you're wondering why am i why aren't my prayers being answered why isn't my offering being accepted? Why is God rejecting me? Even though all of it is like, yeah, you're doing all this stuff up at the altar. Why? Because I see the way you treat your wife. <laughs> it's like, oh, ouch, right? So <laughs> I'm like, actually, I, I'm like, when you read the whole context, I'm like, man, okay. Um, all, all of their religious activity is meaningless. It's being rejected by God because he sees how they treat their wives. Um, and you'll see something later, I believe it's first Peter, says something kind of similar that he Paul says something very similar am I? Uh, no, no, I'll, I'll get it because I didn't write it down <laughs> where it is in Peter if it was one of Paul's letters but where there's a reference to a very similar thing of, of God isn't hearing hearing your prayer because he judges you because of the way you treat your wives um, it's a common idea so yes if we look at here God does hate divorce but people quote it they often don't even finish the sentence okay because there's a whole sentence of what God says he hates. I hate divorce and him who covers his garment with wrong, right? We should, we should make sure we get the second half of that. So that word wrong, I think it's kind of a weird translation. The word wrong um, is important because it could probably better be translated as violence. Um, it's often used in a legal context for those who committed a violent crime, even the Old Testament law someone who's committed a violent crime, they would use that same word, right? Uh, so if you were in court, that's a, that's a legal term, right? So we do see God speaking forcefully here and his anger is showing. So there is something he hates, but it's directed at violent, abusive men, honestly. That's what we're talking about. Uh, who mistreat and abandon their wives when they find someone they like better. And so 
At that time, these men were mistreating their wives. They were leaving them, abandoning them to being destitute. And honestly, a lot of them, because the other issue in this section is he's talking about they were picking up uh, foreign women who were worshiping other gods, and they get into all kinds of idol worship as well. So they're picking up, you know, this is kind of what's happening. <laughs> so he sees what they're doing. He's, he's advocating for The reason God is getting angry here and saying, I hate this, why his anger is showing is because I see what you're doing to your wives, right? If you think I don't notice the way you're violently abusing your wives, abandoning them, leaving them destitute, go find another woman, then go worship their idols, like, this is not, not pretty. Um, so if you're looking for, um, if, if you're looking to this to justify pushing back on somebody about divorce, I would be careful. <laughs> because I think this is actually, if you're in an abusive situation, this is much more advocating that God is on your side. It, 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 this is showing God cares very much. Once again, we talk about helping out a victim, right? So we're talking about, you know, the idea being to protect a vulnerable person, right? And that's that's the same here. God, you see God jumping in to say, to protect vulnerable people. There's the combination of idolatry, sexual immorality, and the way they're violently dealing with their wives. Um, and so, yes, God hates this. I hope so, because I hate it too, <laughs> right? I, I, you know, well, you, you read the whole thing and you're like, yeah, I, I want God to be angry about that when you know what's going on there, right? And so if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, so if we're looking at clear, systematic, you know, allowable reasons for divorce. We want to kind of like break some of that down. It, I could, we could take a long time. I won't, I won't dig into all of that because the Bible can be very confusing. The more you get into some of these passages, like about divorce, the more kind of muddy it gets. Um, you might find the Bible frustrating if you're looking for a really clear system on all of that. Um, if you feel you have it nailed down, you find a kind of weird exception that throws you off. So we have a prophet, Hosea, who's called to forgive and return to his adulterous wife. You know, we were all like, okay, well, adultery is the one exception, except if you're Hosea, who's specifically ordered to go back to his adulterous wife. <laughs> kind of throws us off. Gomer, that whole one. That's a weird one. You, you have God hates divorce, and you see we've just been reading all that, and the strong language around divorce. But then you have in Jeremiah 3, 8, when God is sending Israel into captivity, it says, God says that he gave Israel a certificate of divorce and sent her away. That's God's putting that on himself, that saying that he did that. So it's kind of like, oh, that's weird. Paul, and Paul makes similar strong statements about the not divorcing his spouse. But you even, uh, he, Paul, in Paul's case, when he's talking to, um, when he's talking to more Greek culture, he even talks to both men and to women, so in 1 Corinthians and stuff. So because there's more, still very patriarchal, but women had more ability in that culture, depending on who they were, uh, to do stuff. So he, uh, he talks about men and women in his case, but he also adds an exception for an unbelieving spouse who wants to leave. That's the one explicit exception that Paul makes. Um, but Paul seems to kind of understand that there are times when being at peace with others is more important than fighting for this broken, hopeless marriage. So there, there's, there's these little cracks. It doesn't give us an explicit kind of uh, lay it out in a systematic way. You get these pieces you put together, and I think we have to look for some principles that kind of guide us in it. So um, a couple things. One is that divorce is never good, but it's sometimes necessary. I think this is kind of what we get from Jesus' words originally. Take great care and caution before considering a divorce. Right? It, it gets, I was, I, I've seen a lot of people through divorces, so this is very familiar territory to me. From the counseling side, I, it is painful in a lot of ways, even when it needs to happen, even when it's very clear that it needs to happen. It's a lot like a grief. It's like the death of a relationship, the death of your dreams of a relationship, a lot of that kind of stuff. And so it, it's, it's a lot like grieving a loss. And so it is painful, even if you are just, a lot of people will be in a situation of like, oh, I'd be so relieved just to get out of this. And then they're surprised like how much grief they have, even with somebody that they really can't stand anymore. So it is, it, it, with all that, it, it is a hard thing. And that, that's even not considering like dealing with kids and custody and finances and there's all kinds of messes that come with it and it can be a whole big mess. So 
it's it's never a good thing even when it's necessary but it is sometimes necessary to happen sometimes that's the only and the only way we can do it and sometimes people are in a bind if they're in an unhealthy abusive relationship especially because that's what we've been talking about if they've been all but abandoned by a spouse or um in, in which case this these times divorce sometimes the only way somebody can move forward it's the only option they have that allows them to be free and be safe and be healthy so sometimes it's just necessary and so it's never good but sometimes necessary and so that's what i would say also say if uh, we have to strike a balance between a firm commitment and protecting the vulnerable and th these are always you know when you're weighing these kind of things if you're talking with somebody who's weighing those things those two things have to be and i think this is what scripture is emphasizing when it talks about it. I think those two things are usually what it's weighing. Um, on the one hand, like understanding the commitment, what Jesus talked about in Genesis, like it was never created to be something frivolous. It was never something that like, oh, I'm tired of this, I'm moving on. It's intended to be a very firm commitment, it's intended to you bond with this person, these two become one. Like that was never the design, right? But we have to balance that. We can't get to so hard on this commitment side that we end up hurting vulnerable people. That's, that's what happened. The, the example we gave at the beginning, right, uh, of, that happened at the Village Church, when they were so just rapidly, like, we're going to be really strong on commitment. People get really obsessed with that. You end up losing sight of there are times when you have to protect vulnerable people from an abusive marriage situation, and you need to be ready to say, we're not going to hold up you know, marriage and divorce so hard that it becomes like an idolatry and we end up hurting people. That's what will happen because there are, we're in a broken world. Abuse happens. Cheating happens. Bad, you know, narcissistic, abusive husbands happen, right? Like that stuff happens. And sometimes when we see somebody hurting, we have to help protect them and, and help them get freedom from a dangerous situation. So both are heavily emphasized in scripture. And so Sometimes they seem to conflict with one another. The, the messy part, you can't, it, it won't give you this nice little neat formula in scripture because it gets messy when you're helping. I, I've walked a lot of people through making that decision and it gets tricky, right? When we're trying to balance those two things. They don't always fit very well together. And so it, it becomes hard and that person has to make hard, challenging decisions. So, uh, but we try to balance those two. And so I want to see one more story. It tells us how we misjudge biblical characters because of this emphasis on marriage. So I want to look briefly with seeing these kind of situations differently and how we see people that are in the middle of that. Um, a pretty well-known story in John that I think we often misinterpret. So in John 4, Jesus is leaving Jerusalem and heading north to the region of Galilee, and it says that he had to pass through Samaria. Geographically, he did not have to go that way. Um, that was the most direct way, but Jews hated Samaritans. There was a lot of kind of, there's both religious and kind of ethnic kind of thing. Um, so they, they really, there's a lot of prejudice against Samaritans. They did not like them, and they had well-worn paths to go around Samaria to not have to go through there. So when it, and it says that he had to pass through Samaria, uh, it was more of an I have an appointment kind of thing, right? Like I have somewhere I have to be. Is what it's saying. Um, so there's something Jesus really needs to do. He goes to a town in Samaria. He sits on the well in the heat of the day when no one else would come. And he sends all 12 disciples to, away to get food. These all seem like overkill, right? Like, I'm going to go somewhere. No one else comes to a well at the heat of the day. People go to the well in the morning when it's cool to get their water and go back. So the only person who's going to go in the heat of the day is somebody who doesn't want to be around everybody else, right? So someone who's in shame or who feels rejected, who doesn't fit, right? So since I don't want to go and everybody else is going, I'll take, I'll go in the heat of the day and do the extra work so I can avoid people. So this is when Jesus goes and he sits on the well. He sends all the disciples away to get food. Um, so this lady is not going to miss him. And when she shows up at the well, there's Jesus waiting for her. And he asks her for a drink. So... Um, this woman, she's surprised when Jesus asks her. So we won't go through and read the whole thing, but she's, she's surprised because Jews don't normally talk to Samaritans. They certainly don't ask them for water. They don't any of this. So there's this, why are you talking to me? 
Jews do not normally do that. And as to a Samaritan, to a woman, all this stuff, it's, it's very culturally odd that Jews would do that. So he begins to talk to her about giving her living water. She's clearly intrigued, but still confused. So she asks him to give her this water. She's like, yes, whatever this living water is you're talking about, give it to me. I won't have to come back here for water all the time. And so here's Jesus' response. He says to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus says to her, you've correctly said I have no husband, but you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you've said truly. The woman says to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> it's kind of an odd response. Mm -hmm. Jesus just throws it out there like, by the way, I already know. <laughs> He's calling out her big issue. She's clear, she clearly, we the story, she's clearly kind of trying to hide in a way. Like she's definitely doing some shame, but she just wouldn't let her hide. So how would you characterize her when you first see her here? Would you, would you read that like, what do you think of her? <laughs> it's the way she's usually talked about. <laughs> Immoral, adulterous, you know. She's she's getting married a lot. She just keeps going from husband to husband, right? And Almost now every. She's with a woman too. Yeah, and now she's living with a guy who's not her husband, right? Yeah. Like, so you think of, and I think that's our cultural thing. We we see her as a promiscuous woman, right? And every time I've heard this talk, I think she's been characterized this way. But I want you to remember some of the things we've already learned, right? Do you think she wanted or sought those divorces? Likely not. Like, women didn't initiate those divorces, right? Um, and so we see often the women were the victims in those situations. So if she was married five times and now living with someone, she had been serially left, serially abandoned, serially hurt, right, by the people. No doubt she was a pretty broken person. And, I'm, and her culture very much shamed her. So she's very much reacting in a shame filled way plus culturally she she'd been rejected multiple times so she's very much uh, rejected in shame that's likely why she ends up living with a man not her husband because she's desperate right no one else would take her so but we have to be careful not to read our own culture into this story because in our case we see a woman who's like you meet a woman you're like she's been married five times and now she's living with a guy and you're like man you just can't hold marriage together <laughs> right you just think man she's she must be kind of a mess or something right you think you immediately kind of jump to these conclusions and so we see her jesus calling her out and saying yeah you've had five husbands and now you're living with a guy right you think of jesus as kind of calling her out in that way but i think i don't think that's what jesus is seeing right her culture very much shamed her as a woman um she was very much rejected but she her being married five times says guys had mistreated her right and the more that happens, the less likely a good quality or caring guy is likely to want to take her on, right? As that goes in that culture, the guys who are gonna want to marry her become probably less and less quality uh, of people. And so she's, she's become an outcast in her society. She was seen as worthless, I'm sure, by her culture, but Jesus did not see her as worthless. That's what all of this intentionality that Jesus is doing in there shows. Jesus does not see her as worthless. Jesus is like super intentional. Before he even leaves, at, you know, and is heading to Galilee, and it, before he leaves and is heading north, he's saying, I have someone I have to go see. And it's her, like yeah. no one wanted to see her, right? And Jesus is saying, that's who I have to go see. I have an appointment, she doesn't know it yet, but I'm gonna make sure she sees me today, right? It, to me, it's one of my favorite stories, partly because Jesus kind of dumbfounds me in this story. It's like, how did you know her? Like, what is it? If Jesus it says, here's somebody I have to go meet. Like, there's not many people that you see Jesus with this much intentionality saying, that's somebody I have to talk to. And this is the last person. Even if you're not judgmental, like the last person you'd expect him to go see. Right? Like, it's just, I mean, she's a Samaritan. She's a woman, already two strikes against her been married five times, living with a guy now. She's a, a reject on so many levels in their culture that she's just seen as nobody. And Jesus is saying, she's very important to me. And not only that, but Jesus was not wrong, right? He had a purpose for her. Um, she didn't understand much of what Jesus is saying. If you go through this this long dialogue that he has with her, he's kind of like, like the water comment. He's saying, 
if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask, I give you living water. You'd never thirst again. And she's like, give me this water. I won't have to come back to the well anymore. Like she's not, he's talking about bigger things. She's not getting it. She's asking some kind of odd questions. She doesn't seem to totally get what he's talking about, but she got that. She got when he called out and he was like, I already know you've been married five times. <laughs> that is, she's like, okay, I perceive you're a prophet. Um, and Jesus was super intentional with her and he sends her away. Um, he sends her back to her hometown and she goes back to her hometown and says, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. So this, this woman who no one had any time for, who was completely rejected, a huge crowd of people come back later. So by the time the disciples come back and they're saying, who is this woman you're talking to? Why are you talking to her? They're kind of confused too by his behavior. But the Jesus starts having this comment and he says that the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. So he's telling them to get ready. And a short time later, here comes a huge crowd from that town coming to meet with him, and a lot of people end up following him. So what you see is her message was very impactful. Jesus used her to bring many people in Samaria to faith. And he knew, I mean, I don't know how much he knew, but the Holy Spirit's leading him, obviously, in this. And Jesus knew this person's very vital. He had a, a very intentional purpose for her. Um, and someone that no one else in the world would have thought anything of. She was probably invisible to most people. And so we assume kind of that she's like running away from God. We assume she wants to live like the rest of the world or she's some immoral kind of person. Um, but we, we can get these things wrong. And, I, and my point is we, we can get the biblical character wrong when we do this, um, but we can do the same thing in abusive marriages. And so much like we can look and be like, we see a situation and we go, uh, an immoral woman, right? That's, that's the easy assumption there, right? And we forget what's probably the reality behind that, right? Uh, the same thing can kind of happen in abusive situations. So we can see, uh, we see a man with a cultivated image who paints himself as a victim because his poor guy, his wife is leaving him. Um, we can see, um, we, we can hold these assumptions pretty lightly because you know maybe he's not as nice as his cultivated image seems to be, right? We see a woman who seems desperate and emotional and we think, oh, well, she must, she's kind of a mess, right? She seems desperate. She's, you know, she doesn't seem under control. She's, and now she's, she's the one initiating and trying to leave and all this kind of stuff. So we think, oh, well, this woman must be the problem. She must be, you know, unstable or something like that. Or, She's immoral. She just she just doesn't care about marriage. She's trying to leave. Or you know, oftentimes in an abusive situation, it's it's the abused, it's the victim that looks more unstable, right? Because they're the ones struggling, right? And so this abuser often has a cultivated image that looks good. And so she might have been the faithful one all along, right? In the marriage, right? She might have been the one fighting through manipulation, abuse, infidelity to try and save her marriage for years and years and years until she finally breaks and she's like, I just gotta get out of here. Like, I gotta find a way to get away from him, right? She may be finally setting boundaries on an abusive man, right? But, and so we wanna be careful not to judge by appearances. And this is really important when we're talking about abuse cases because the appearances will lead you astray. <laughs> and when often it's like, okay, this is the vulnerable victim. That's why she's so desperate. That's why, you know, it feels erratic and why she seems, you know, she seems kind of crazy. Well, she, she's been driven crazy, perhaps, by her situation. And be willing to not judge by appearances before we can uh, get to know and find out what's going on behind closed doors. Um, so I wanted to think about that as an emblematic of what can happen in the real world. And so think about real world implications here. In 21st century American culture, abuse, context for divorce, um, I want to remember a few things that we have to do. Number one is that the victim usually initiates divorce. Um, because in our, in our cases, usually, abusive men don't want her to leave. They, they may be cheating on her, but they don't want her to leave. <laughs> you know, uh, In most cases, in an abusive, controlling kind of environment, he's very much manipulating and trying to keep her around because he wants to be in control. So if that doesn't mean the victim is the problem because they're initiating the divorce, right? 
So if we, this is where like we get so obsessed with keeping a, a marriage together that we, we can lose sight of that. We start to see the victim as the problem because they're the ones pushing for a separation. They're pushing for a divorce. Well, they're going to be in an abusive scenario. They just will because it doesn't, it doesn't mean they're the less committed spouse. And I think sometimes people make that assumption. Uh, in an abusive marriage, it's usually the opposite. And if the abuser is narcissistic, they will care much more about appearances, much more about narratives and how this story is going to go. Uh, you know, we talked last week about how the powerful often drive the narrative, right? And so the the story everybody's going to hear is going to be driven by this guy who's, who's used to polishing up his image and not showing that side of himself. So often it ends up looking, the, often the abuser ends up looking better publicly. It's not uncommon at all. So don't accept a shallow view of the situation. If you, if you are going through it, if, especially if you know somebody who's going through it, don't accept the shallow view. If you want to be willing to ask, be willing to dig deeper, um, be willing to see what God is actually doing. He might be in process of delivering a godly person from an abusive spouse. And if that's the case, you don't want to get in the way of that. You want to help, right? So we don't want to be saying, oh, no, 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 no. We, we, we really want to, you know, a lot of well-meaning Christian people say, oh, no, no, we don't want to end your marriage. You know, we're, we're, we want to fight to keep the marriage. Well, if, if they've been fighting for it, and this is an abusive person who has no interest in trying to change, they may just be trying to get saved. And if that's the case, we don't want to stand in the way of that. We don't want to hold them back any longer. If they've got an opportunity to get saved from somebody who's dangerous, we want to help that and support that. You're not going to necessarily know. Like I said, a lot of abuse contexts, what we have is guys who are hiding that very, very well. So sometimes it's hard to get to the truth, and that takes a while. Just want to hold your perceptions very loosely if you're with somebody who's who's struggling. Um, so be willing to ask questions, willing to dig deeper, see what God's doing. Don't jump to conclusions because, like I said, the victim usually initiates divorce. Uh, the second thing is safety comes first. Um, no matter your impression of the marriage or how fixable the issues are, a person must be safe both physically and emotionally if they're going to be able to work on things. I found this even in cases where I'm with somebody who's had some abusive tendencies. I've seen people get better. I've seen people who were serial adulterers or have sexual addiction issues get better. I've seen people who in the past were pretty verbally abusive get better. Um, I've seen people with some not any heavy physical abuse <laughs> tendencies. Those, those that I've dealt with generally don't change, but they can change. It does happen, but even in that case where it's gonna change, even if you're in a case where you have an abuser who really is trying to change and you, and you think there's still a chance of saving this relationship, it won't happen if the victim is not safe. You, you can't really work on it. It's usually, if they're still under the same roof, it's just too close, it's too messy, and they can't step back from it all and see it clearly enough to fix it. So even when I've been in a case where I'm helping somebody try and fix, and they're both trying to fix the marriage from some of these abusive type of issues, I find it won't work until there's some sense of safety because the victim's gonna have to find her voice. Mm -hmm. She's gonna have to find some assertiveness and she needs to feel safe enough that I can push back and say, that's not okay. I have to know that I can say, I don't like that without facing repercussions, right? I have to know that that's safe to do. So that safety has to come first before we can really do anything. And if someone's telling you either, like I said, certainly physically, if somebody's under threat, we want to do anything we can to get them to a place of safety. Sometimes that's a long process, you know? We talked last week, and Shelly talked about what happens when somebody's reporting, right? Sometimes they go back to that person multiple times because it's safer to be with him than it is to leave because I don't know if he'll kill me if I leave, right? Some people are in that scenario, so it, it's not easy to know how to get to safety. That's complicated, and, but we wanna help that in any way if we can uh, as that goes on. But uh, some people might go back for a while. They might back off. We have to, to let them navigate that. They know this abuser better than we do. So when you're working with somebody and you're trying to help them, sometimes on the other side, you, you want them to get out as quickly as possible because you know it's dangerous. And sometimes it's like, it's not time yet. Their plan is not ready yet. They can't do it yet. They're not ready. Uh, they're emotionally not ready to withdraw themselves and come back or whatever. And so it takes a while. Uh, so you have to be patient with that. But also, they also might decide very quickly to just move out 
It was like, I saw the opportunity. I went in the middle of the night. I left with nothing, right? Sometimes that's the case. But whatever it is, however you can help somebody with safety, that becomes first priority. And then we can you know, get into, is there a chance to fix this? Is there things we can work on? Whatever, we'll see. But uh, make sure safety is first. Third one, don't return without repentance. And repentance is a key word. Repentance literally means to turn around. So when we're dealing with abusers, we're not talking about feeling sorry. Usually abusers are very good about that. If you have a narcissistic abuser, they're good at weaponizing their uh, sorry. They can be very sorrowful and teary-eyed and, oh, I hate myself for what I did. And a lot there's words mean nothing, okay? Good. I'm glad if you do. I'm glad if you genuinely feel that way. And they may genuinely feel that way. A lot of them do genuinely have remorse when they see the results of what they did. There's, there's plenty of them that do. Um, so that can be real. That doesn't mean they've learned anything or changed anything about their behavior. So they can turn around the next week and be back and doing the same thing. So change, someone, if, if someone gets out, if they're separated, and if, they're think, if you're thinking about returning, don't return without seeing a, an actual turnaround of behavior. That's what you're looking for. You're seeing them do things like they would never have done that before. They would never have been able to have this conversation where I'm able to tell them how hurt I was and they actually listened and were patient with me. Or, you know, he's willing to do some things. He's going to treatment. He's going to do some things that he's never been willing to do before. Um, you want real behavioral, real change that shows like this person's doing stuff they would never do. That's, abusers can change, some of them do. But it's usually a slow and humbling process, I will say. The people I've seen change from some of these behaviors, it's not a quick fix. It's not a, I'm really sorry and now it'll all be better. That will not change anything. When those guys change, it is usually a long methodical process of them having to really be humbled by a broken situation. And so their normal methods of manipulation aren't allowed to work anymore. They're keeping themselves in a situation where no one's, no one buys their games anymore and they're willing to be honest about it and people will hold them accountable to it and it gets really hard and it's painful for them. So don't make it easy on them because the only way they're going to change, <laughs> usually they have to be separated for a while from their wife if they really don't want to leave or whatever. They, they need the pain of some of that to force them to work on it. So don't, don't do the quick return without real change of heart, change of behavior. Um, you don't want to make it easy on them. So that's a few things. I'm curious for you guys. Any that's a lot of stuff. Any, any questions, thoughts of, on some of that stuff? I have a comment on the women at the well. Yeah. We watched that on Saturday and it's it's refreshing to see someone that has been we had women that have been abused and sit down mm -hmm. like well we can't you know when you're pushed down to the lowest of low and you feel terrible but to be able to see it really was touching when we watched that story and to see because you know he forgave her and she just became a whole different person and it was it was just like a whole new person and, and mm -hmm. i feel like that's where we all you know we've all thought that god wasn't there with us through all this but he was mm -hmm. and when you see that and you come out the other side of it it's just useless it's, it's basically top of that I think it was what I got out of that that he used her to start spreading his ministry yeah, yeah. You know, she was one of the first ones he had to say go tell people yeah. about this um, before that he was telling his disciples it's not time yet right mm -hmm. and then she used her a broken woman to go spread the word mm -hmm. that he's the Messiah yeah yeah, yeah. that's a beautiful story yeah it is and I think it shows you something of Jesus's heart for broken women I think and it's when you look at some of those other passages we looked at and you see how God was responding to women who were being abused by their husbands <laughs> you're like that was his heart from the beginning so it's not that surprising that that's Jesus's heart for that right like he's mimicking this is how God this is how God reacted in Malachi during that time this is how God was talking about it you know at the time of you know Moses right in Deuteronomy that was God's heart is to protect Vulnerable, he saw vulnerable women who were being taken advantage of by powerful men. I wanted to, and so you see Jesus. One, yes, one of his first people that he empowers to go and spread the word is her, and I think it shows you he's like, I'm, I'm going to use her. I'm, I'm going to 
put all this effort and time into this person. This is who I want to be. Right. I feel like that's kind of where my story is because I was a victim and for a long time that's all I saw was that I'm a victim, I had that mentality, I always, you know, I didn't yeah. know. And then once you turn around and see yourself as a survivor, you turn around and help other women in the same, you know now what all that was that you went through, all that pain you went through was for a purpose, and now my purpose is to do his work and, and help other women, so yeah, I, I love my story a lot. <laughs> Does it build something in you? When you go through that yourself, it builds a, it requires a lot of strength yeah. to get out of a bad situation, right? To recover. And it gives you a compassion and a different insight into someone else, right? Like you recognize what Jesus is saying, like that this person who everybody else is disregarding, wait, like there's something powerful here. You, you get eyes to see that in a way when you've been through it, um, that people who've never seen it or experienced it misjudge it a lot. Yeah. And so, um, I think it gives you kind of eyes to see people in a new way and a compassion for people in a new way. So to know that God wants to use that. And that he'll go out of his way <laughs> to you to get you to do that. Yeah. Too. Like that's really cool. Like yes. he went out of his way to meet that woman at the well that he, she didn't even know she was there. In the heat of the day, and like, waited for her. She's going in order to avoid people. Yeah. And he literally <laughs> like goes out of his way to be there with yeah, I just it's one of my favorites. So, um, so yeah, well, I, I hope that breaks down some. Like I said, the, the the whole divorce issue, it's a complicated issue in the scriptures. So, I don't want to make light of that. Like you could dig into that a whole lot deeper, and we could nuance a lot of stuff. Um, but yeah, I hope you know it's a little more complicated, uh, and not so. And I hope with very least, someone's like, "Well, God hates divorce." You'll be like. Okay, let's go read that. <laughs> yeah, right. Wait a minute. I don't just accept those little like soundbite kind of reactions that think they they've simplified it all into that one little statement. It's like, whoa, it's not that easy, yeah. right? Like, I hope that we can break down some of those misconceptions. So, anyway, all right. Thanks, everybody. It's been good.